This is our second section of the GIS part of our computer aided archaeology course. And this time we will talk more in direction of application. So I will show you some techniques with which you can visualize your spatial data but also the connected uh, content data. And since this is very practical, uh, there will be a strong focus this time on the practical videos. And I will try to keep this video as short as possible, S try to stay within half the m uh, our range here. So immediately let's get started. And the first thing that you need to do if you haven't um, uh, digital or if you're not digitizing your data on the spot is to get your data into uh, QGIS. And it's fairly simple in respect to different file formats, the standard file formats. For other, it might be more complicated. But um, if we talk about shape files and um, some background maps in GeoTIFFs, that's straightforward. Whenever it comes to CSV files, for example, it's a bit more complicated, but still it is uh, very possible. When you have some uh, exotic file formats, it might be more difficult. Nevertheless, if you start QGIS, um, you probably already know that you're greeted with your recent projects if you have already some, and it might be good to start a new project by clicking on project and uh, new project or here on this blank sheet, and then you're ready to go. Then you have an empty screen and there you would probably like to import your vector data in respect to shapefiles. And that's fairly easy. If you click on layer, add layer, you will be greeted with a lot of different options here. Um, so you can add a vector layer or a raster layer. That's the main things that we uh, will do now. Uh, there are some links to different uh, different database formats here uh, from which you also can get some spatial information or from uh, the web or also some raster files from specific um, data and we will also talk about this delimited text layer which is essentially a CSV file and how we can add a virtual layer uh, later on and what a virtual layer is. So if we want to load shapefile you go to layer add layer and then add vector layer and uh, then you will be greeted with this import form and here you can select from file um, the specific data set that you would like to load and then you point to the .shp file from your shape files and this will load the shape file into your computer and then you should see some points already appearing on the map and that's all there is about that. In the background, the GIS uh, software will take care of projecting the informations into the right projection system that you have uh, set up for your project. And in that sense, you should be able to see um, the files or the, the points on your screen. If there's a problem with the uh, coordinate reference system, you will have to deal with that, but for the things that we are doing right now, this should not be a problem. The next way of how you can import actual um, spatial information and raster uh, vector kind of information are CSV files. And we worked a bit already with CSV files, so it's this general text based spreadsheet format which is simple and robust and in general human readable which is one of the big advantages here and it's very simple so there's a lot of possibilities to import that and also here for GS systems it's a very robust way of getting data into uh, the GS which have coordinates or probably also don't have coordinates and are just referring to some um, content information but um, in that case, you have to have a good idea about the projection system in which the data come. So here, this is how such a CSV file can look like. And um, you have to take care also for if you have a comma separated file, so the original CSV file where the individual columns are separated by commas, 
or if this is a continental version with a semicolon and you have to set this in the GIS if you like to import that. Also if you want to map the information uh, directly you probably would like to have this uh, coordinates here. Uh, it doesn't matter how the coordinate columns are called because you can select them uh, yourself but uh, it is easier uh, or more straightforward if you already have um, them in X and Y uh, columns there then uh, the JS will automatically identify which one is which in respect of the uh, coordinates but it's not necessary so to get this kind of data into QGIS or first uh, of course uh, again here you can display a CSV file also in the spreadsheet software Excel or LibreOffice Calc or whatever you like and uh, there you have the m a more convenient way of looking and editing these files than just from the simple text editor but in the back it's this very simple file format. Okay to add a CSV file to GIS you go again to layer add layer and then you uh, select a delimited text layer or getrennte textdatei als layer hinzufügen and then you will see this kind of dialog which is similar to the one that have we have seen before but now here the limited text is selected or getrennte texte and you have a bit more um, possibilities to set things here for example uh, you probably would like to select the file format and here CSV is uh, pre-selected usually if you start it up and then you have to define if you have point coordinates here in your CSV file because in the CSV file uh, you can only import points not more complex geometries or if you have something that's called well-known text uh, we will not talk about that here but it's another way of storing geographic information or you don't have any geometry uh, then it is a simple attribute table what that is so uh, essentially these are content data um, we will deal with that later on so usually if you have some coordinates you will select po point coordinates punkt coordinaten and then you can select the x and y file and you would also need to select I can always check if the uh, um, import is okayish by looking at this first uh, example data here and then you have to select the coordinate reference system after you set the coordinate columns or before it doesn't matter and here you have to have an idea what kind of coordinate system your data come with so if uh, you have latitude longitude coordinates most of the time it will be 4326 that's the latitude longitude WGS 84 um, format that is probably the most widespread uh, way of how you can get some geographic information. Um, yeah, You have to have an idea what, uh, what coordinate system you have and if the coordinate system that you um, would like to choose is not visible here in the, um, in the drop down menu you can always click on this uh, world symbol here and then you get a more uh, complete um, search window where you can access all the available coordinate system here and then select the right one for example if you have some data from uh, Google Maps you probably would like to have pseudo Mercator WGS 84 which is uh, 3857 as EPSG code and then you can select this here once you have done that you have selected your uh, coordinates and your projection system you can click on uh, add and close and then your points should appear also in the map view and most of the time it starts with a random selection of how the points are styled I will not go into detail here how you can change that just simply if you right click on the layer and select properties you get this kind of dialog here and there is this option symbology that's probably at the beginning the most uh, relevant for you and here you can select multiple ways how to style individual symbols so if all the points on your map will have the same symbol you can change that here 
to more complicated options. We will come later. If you want to have a full overview how you can style things, there is another video from the JS course that you can uh, watch if you want to make more fancy maps here. The second thing that you probably would like to do is not only style the features but also label them so that you can see on the map what actually the individual points uh, represent. And there is um, below symbology there is the option labels and here you can select labels um, for example a single label from your data so single label means there's uh, one column that is used for labeling uh, the individual points and most of the time that's what you probably would like to do uh, there are some more complicated options um, but we will not deal with that if you select single labels then you have different options here to style your text make use a different font have some background uh, or some drop shadow there and um, also define how the placement of the label should be in relation to the individual points. Also for this there is a specific video from the JS course that you can watch but um, I would suggest that you just play around with the options and see what fits best and that's also the way how you learn um, all the possibilities here much better and much easier. I um, hope I'm not blocking too much of the view. Um, I'm thinking uh, that you will see most of the things from the screen like that. Okay, that's for getting points and more complicated vectors with CSV files and shape files. But if you want to have some background for your map, um, probably you have already a pr predefined background, for example, from the scanned images that you have georeferenced in uh, last time. Um, there is also the, the possibility to import raster data and most of the time you will probably use GeoTIFFs because it's at the moment a quasi standard. If you have more specific files, for example some satellite imagery, they might come in different formats but then you have uh, to see um, how you can really import that. But most of the time um, QGIS should take out all the hassle for that. So essentially if you want to have a raster file you click on layer add layer add raster layer and then you can select the raster data set uh, clicking on these three dots and selecting the file on your um, file system and then um, so like that here it's the background tiff geo tiff that uh, is selected here and then you click on ok or add and close and then you should be greeted with your background information there. If if you would do it in this order, the background layer will probably cover your individual points that you have. And in that case, um, you can order these layers. Remember, um, uh, GIS system usually works with the uh, philosophy or the, the metaphor of um, transparent slides so whatever you put on top will cover what is below there and in the layer panel to the bottom left of your screen most of the by default you can order the layers by just drag and drop um, the layers into the correct order and then uh, also on your map the layers should appear in the right order like if you would pile up transparent sheets on top of each other so what kind of base map should you choose? And this is a bit more theoretical part here. <coughs> so think about what someone reading your map needs to see for context. What is really necessary and reduce uh, your base map as much as possible in respect to this context. Um, so what you really want to show is um, your data and um, this should always stand out and your base map should be uh, as reduced as possible giving the, uh, the viewer the possibility to see in which context your, your data appear. So uh, most of the time you will have some um, mountain ranges and water bodies that give the reader the idea where they are located and that should be enough. Also think about how the base map interacts with your data. For example if you have a uh, 
green, mostly green background map, it doesn't make any sense to have uh, green symbols for your data because they will just um, merge with the background and that's not what you would like to have. So always try to have a lot of contrast between your data and the background map, which also um, involves, for example, using grayscale background maps uh, whenever it's possible in scientific context. Um, and this links to this uh, option of hierarchy. If your data is uh, the most important part of the map, and that's most of the time when you present data in a scientific context, make sure that it looks more important than your base map and avoid those base maps uh, that strongly emphasize features that are not relevant on your map. For example, if you have man-made features like buildings or roads, um, they, can, they, they are not necessary in uh, representing prehistoric or archaeological data, so you should select a base map where these objects are not visible or at least very, very uh, subtle represented. And I talked a bit about already about colors, so choose um, base maps that complement the colors on your map. So there should always be a link between the colors um, of your data and the colors of the base map. And again, the contrast uh, should be there between the colors of your data that it is clearly visible what uh, is represented with what here and what is the most important part. What you also need to consider is the scale of your base map. <coughs> so there are can be base maps that are very, very detailed and there you can see a lot of details that are probably not necessary and um, they might also, um, if you have a very detailed base map and you scale out a lot, you will probably see a lot of uh, blurring or um, a lot of noise in the background that is not clearly identifiable because it's too small um, but on the other hand it is still there so when you do overarching mapping you should also have a base map that uh, is essentially um, in a larger scale so that only the relevant parts are visible there to that need to be seen on that scale to give the reader a context there and uh, additionally to that, very detailed base maps will also have quite a large um, necessity of uh, storage space. So that's something also that you need to consider uh, because uh, this raster geographic information can be very large um, very soon. So um, one of the standard sets that uh, you will see later on that you can use for large scale mapping of the whole world will easily have uh, 400, 500 megabytes per base map and this is already an amount that even today is still um, yeah, relevant for recent computers. Also it will slow probably down the processing of your data in the end. So always select a base map of that scale that is um, decent for your um, part of the world that you would like to represent here what kind of base maps you can use. <laughs> Probably the most straightforward one is use the uh, scanned georeferenced map uh, that you have. So you scan uh, um, a blind map or um, the, the site map that you have already uh, used, for example, to, to digitize your points there. But this quite often will look a bit awkward. Um, on the one hand, um, if there is this scanned map in the background, you will probably have your features twice, once in the scanned map, once from your actual data, and that will interfere with each other. Also, um, since you probably will not work in the production system that the original map was, um, you will get uh, some distortions here, and this also will look strange probably. So it's better to use different base maps than original scanned ones. And there's this uh, data set, uh, or you can use pre-produced background maps, for example, from this data set Natural Earth Data. You can click on this link here and see what they offer. So they have a worldwide coverage. If um, you have a small scale, um, that means you see l a large part of the world. Uh, these maps are very, very handy. If you zoom in quite a lot, um, 
then uh, they become very pixelated and are probably not very useful to map very detailed parts of the world. For that you need to have some, some other base maps. One easy way to get a large variety of base maps that also come in different scales are um, this quick map service plugin. There are probably also others available for QGIS um, that give you access to web maps that you can directly include into your mapping and there you have limited options of possibilities but there are some that are very usable for also archaeological mapping when it comes to different scales here. Um, most of the time they also include man-made features like roads and stuff like that. If they are not dis a disturbing factor for your map um, then you can use them. There are also some base maps here available from these web services that don't include these features so you have to play around with these options. You can also link directly some online maps to QGIS but it's more complicated uh, procedure. For starter I would suggest that you use this plugin. And if you want to really get fancy you can build a base map from scratch so for example this one uh, was built by me using water bodies and um, elevation data and a bit of hill shading that this map looks nice. Um, so probably you get the best results because you can really define what kind of um, elements you would like to see but it's also the most complicated part and if you really want to go that I would suggest that either you look into the videos from the GIS course or actually visit the GIS course that will be given into uh, semesters, I think. So for most of the uh, parts you're quite fine with these kind of options for a background map if this is necessary and you can also download some vector data directly from natural earth data and um, then you don't have a proper raster background map but for orientation of uh, your data this might already be enough to have some information about mountain ranges and about water bodies and then you're good to go. Okay, let's start a bit with some visualization and one of the things that you probably um, could visualize are these heat maps that are nowadays well known from football um, um, yeah, coverage uh, where you can see for example in which part of the, the area uh, one player was uh, most of the time uh, active. But they are also important for archaeological mapping because here you can see for example site densities in respect of the whole landscape and get some information or idea where we have more sites than others. If we just have point data there they can cover each other and uh, it's probably not so easy to see where are the more dense parts uh, of occupation. In that case these kind of heat maps are um, very helpful. There are multiple ways to achieve this kind of heat map. There is a more complicated way but the most simple is actually uh, you have your original point layer, you right click on the layer and make a duplicate of this layer and then you right click on uh, the lower layer of the two duplicated layers and select properties their uh, symbology and then you have the option here to select heat map there and then you have already a simple heat map with your points on top of that and for a lot of purposes this might be enough already. There is more uh, there are ways how you can influence more the creation of this heat map and the, the rendering and the look of this heat map. You can influence partly this also with this simple version here. But if you really want to have a fancy heat map, there's another video from the GIS course that shows you how you can do that. For our purposes, it's probably enough to have this very simple heat map available. Now we have <coughs> only talked about the geographic informations, the uh, geometries and where individual points are in space but most of the time you would like to work with a GIS to also be able to show more content related data that are not directly spatial data but are um, connected with um, some values that are recorded on the individual sites here. And for that, 
for this additional data, beside uh, just the uh, geographic in, uh, location, there is the attribute table that's part of, uh, for example, a shape file, but it also it can be part of a CSV file. And this attribute table contains all these different informations. You can access this attribute table by right-clicking on the layer and select Open Attribute Table. And then you can see this table here with uh, and this time it's very simple you have an ID column and a label column but you can freely design what kind of information you would like to store additionally to the actual location here and um, you can also import a lot of uh, these informations we will see later on how you can do that with CSV files there's another view on this attribute table and it's the form view you can switch that here by uh, clicking on this this button down below here and in this form view you see something like a form in a database and here you can probably easier more easy enter information to individual um, locations if this is a very complicated uh, and data rich uh, version maybe that's more convenient than have a big table here but most of the time probably this table view is what you actually would like to work with um, there are some things that you have to be considered in respect of shape files and attribute tables column names can only be letters and numbers and underscores you should not use any blank spaces in your column names um, column names can only be 10 characters long which is annoying uh, but um, in that situation you need to find some abbreviations for your information and with that you are able to use these kind of informations here with these limits so um, try to get short and uh, pronounced labels names for your columns and then you're good to go okay now what can we use with these um, informations and how we for example can add some uh, content information to the individual points you started with um, georeferencing and digitizing some points and you probably have only an ID column and um, nothing more. You could also always start to add some information directly in the JS but most of the time you will have your data stored externally for example in a database like we have and um, there are ways how you connect can connect this data to your actual stored points given that you have a unique identifier that identifies at the same time the point on your map and uh, the, the row in your your data table and if you can connect these two um, then you are able to import these data to your uh, geographic locations I will you will see some videos in the practical part how you can do that so I can just shortly go over the different options here we have three possibilities either you have a simple one-to-one -one relationship where you have a uh, data row that is connected to just one point or you have a bit more complex scenario where you want to add more column uh, more um, hierarchical more complicated situation in an uh, one to m um, scenario but you still would like to have one row for each point in that case you can prepare a pivot table uh, for example for plotting diagrams for the relationship between for example the number of different artifact types for your original uh, point and if you have uh, you can do it uh, also within the QGIS system to uh, store information in an one to m relationship and then add uh, or connect these informations using a bit of SQL tool. We'll go through this here very quickly but for each of these options there is a specific video how you can do that and what you can achieve with that. So the simple situation would be you have here um, your data set where you have uh, an ID that's um, also stored in your points and each row represents the data of one object in this time here in this sense we have uh, the, the graphs um, relationship of my database and there we have the ID of the individual graves that can be connected to the grave number in the GIS and then some additional information for the graves. 
First, you have to save from uh, the database through LibreOffice Calc, for example. You have to save that into a CSV file, um, like we have done multiple times already. Then you would like to add this CSV file as the limited text layer, uh, like we have done importing a um, CSV file with coordinates. But this time we don't have any coordinates, so you select no geometry. And in that case, it also doesn't matter what kind of geometry CRS is there because we don't have any coordinates that are directly connected to this actual CSV file. So it's just a simple attribute table without any geographic information. We have to add them in the next step. And that is join uh, your already present point data with the attribute table by a common uh, attribute and identifier, for example, grave number in my case. You can right click on the point layer and say properties and besides symbology and labels, which we have already seen, there is also this point joins here and you can add a join uh, database connection by clicking on this plus icon and then you are asked what is the layer you would like to join with this point layer. Uh, what is the join field and what is the target field from your attribute table and if you select that then you will have a join uh, that connects these two and you can work with the new attributes that are now connected to your point layer and for example make some uh, mapping here in symbology you can use that there for example to uh, give <coughs> here the different um, depth of uh, the burials individual color code so that you can see how deep uh, a grave is directly on the map. There are probably more relevant w uh, things that you can map with these different color codes, for example um, different sexes uh, of the buried individuals or something like that. So this is the way how you can connect simply a data table to your geographic information. The result will be a map that shows the values of your data in space and that's what we like to achieve here. If you want to add some diagrams, for example pie charts that give you the percentage of the different attribute types for the individual um, burials, uh, it's a bit more complicated because for example here my uh, artifact table from the database is a straight uh, table where we have the grave number and then the name of the type that's represented there. And to be able to map this to individual graves, we have first to transform this into a table where every row uh, represents the content of one grave. And we did that already before. We make a pivot table <coughs> where um, the grave number here is in the row fields. So we have our identifier here per row. And then uh, in the column fields, we will have the name of the different attributes and count how much, how often this name is used uh, per grave and column. And with that, we get this kind of pivot table that we can again save as CSV file. Probably you have to first to select the original CSV, um, the original pivot table and copy that into a new sheet. Uh, that you have only these informations that are relevant for our mapping there, not the automatic uh, fields from the pivot table, just the content of that. And then you can save that as CSV file. Then you can add this again as the limited text layer without coordinates and the rest is rather straightforward like we have done before in, in the simple version because now we have a simple data set but with much more columns here. And um, so in that case, also we have to join this data set like we did before with the actual spatial data. And if we have done that, we can go to diagrams, not to symbology, but this time to diagrams. And there you have different options, what kind of diagram you would like to present here. For example, a pie chart. Then you select all the columns that should go into the pie chart and should be counted in the pie chart. So in that case, all the uh, burial types here and their numbers. And um, you can still influence a bit the, the uh, layout and the, the style of the diagrams here. You can also select a bar chart here, for example. And then you will see, if you click on apply and OK, you will see some diagrams appearing on your map.
So the result here is then um, a map which is enhanced by uh, different diagrams and how you can do that step by step I explain in the practical video for that. And the last thing you probably would like to do is to map one to M relationships, so quite complicated uh, relationships within QGIS. Um, so in that case I have here again the uh, data set of my artifacts uh, with grave number and with the actual types of the artifacts and this time I directly save this file as it is as a, as a CSV file and let QGIS do the, the pivot tabling here um, which limits our options in respect of diagrams so in that case it's not possible because we don't have these columns not directly possible we don't have these columns separated but you can also do interesting um, stuff with that for example mapping individual artifacts here in that case as I said you just save the CSV file as it comes with the common identifier and add this layer also as the limited text layer uh, without geometry um, uh, like we have done now multiple times and now instead of doing the join inside of um, the, the point layer we create a virtual layer an, an artificial layer uh, which in which you import the embedded layer those layers that you have already loaded with your spatial information the points and the content information the CSV file that you just uh, loaded by um, starting at layer at virtual layer and then on the virtual layer pane you can add here at the embedded layer you can import those layers that you have already loaded into QJS and click on OK and then you have to do a bit of SQL um, what uh, the SQL string will look like um, or need to look like you will see in the practical video essentially you write a bit of this SQL query language select everything that's the, the star from um, your uh, point layer left join that you have all the point layers there um, the layer with your um, content information where and then you connect the uh, point layer dot ID with if ID is your common uh, you, uh, identifier where this is equal to the data layer and then there the common identifier so it's actually a bit of code here but it's straightforward select everything select star from both of these layers with a left join where the uh, ID is equal to the ID at the other layer um, again that is uh, available in the video and I probably will show you uh, in the slide in the published version the SQL query that I used here for my database and then um, you can see if you've done that you can see on in symbology all the different artifact types here um, if you say for example categorized as the the, um, the symbol type not single um, single symbol but categorized you can uh, then click on classify and then according to the name of uh, the artifact and then you will see all these different artifact types here appearing in um, the, the symbology window with different colors in that case it's probably um, not very helpful because in my case I had a lot of different artifact types you so you uh, we'll see a lot of colors here and they will be confusing on the map but we don't have to show them all at the same time now we can start if we have clicked on OK we can start to see all the different artifact types here directly and now we can turn on and off different artifact types here to see where this artifact type is distributed in our map and we can interactively show different artifact types and where they are in space which is quite handy if you want to have a specific map on uh, individual artifact types so the result of that and this is not diagrams this is uh, a wrong heading uh, the result of that is um, a way how you can um, select artifact types that you would like to display for your final map 
Okay, this is how you can use content data in combination with spatial information to map these uh, with different um, levels on your map and use this for your presentation of your data. Now you would like probably to export this result of your work and one of the things you would like probably to export is the actual map itself. Uh, you can always make a screenshot from a GIS system but that's not very convenient. Um, to get more proper maps you can use the print composer. Um, so that's how you make exportable and printable maps in QGIS. You are able to add other elements that uh, are necessary or helpful for maps, for example legends, scale bars, texts and some north arrows and that's what you do in the actual print composer. To start a new print or a new uh, publishable map you click on uh, project and then new print uh, layout or neues druck layout and then you're greeted so first you have to give this layout a name you can leave that blank then it will be the default uh, layout but you can also give it a specific title if you have for example multiple layouts that you would like produce from your original data so with that you have the possibility to store multiple views on your map you're greeted with a blank slate here if you start this print composer and now you can add different elements to uh, your actual sheet of paper. You can also change um, the layout of this this sheet of paper or of this map. So at first you probably would like to add um, a new map. This is this symbol here, this small map symbol. If you click on that and then click and drag you will create the view, your current view from your uh, map window to this um, printed map or to this print composer here and you can still influence some of the features here in the element uh, properties like for example um, the, the scale and other uh, relevant information. You can also have a specific uh, accordion reference system for your ma map for your printed map that's different from the way or how you present your map in your actual mapping window. So that's what you can change here in the properties. Also you can change the extent of the map here directly with numbers but most of the time it's probably more convenient to do that um, by dragging uh, the map around in your print window. Then you can add some text here with the text uh, or uh, labeling function and then you can put um, arbitrary text on your map whatever if you would like to have a title here or uh, your sources um, down below where the original data are coming from from the mapping you can put that in text on your printed map. You can also add a north arrow that, that's this uh, option here you can place it there there are multiple arrow types that you can uh, select if you select this um, arrow after you, after you have put it there and uh, defined its size you can select here in the element uh, properties, different um, pictures of different north arrows. Strictly a north arrow is not necessary if your map is uh, north oriented but um, yeah sometimes you still would like to have one so in that case uh, um, you can add it like that. What you also would like to have is the scale bar that people get an idea how much how large the extent on the map uh, or what is the translation between the extent on the map and the extent of the real world and there is also a simple button that you can click and then draw um, a scale bar and also here you can influence how the scale bar should look like, how many segments it should have and also how it actually, what is the style of this um, scale bar, you can influence that here. All of this is explained in much more detail in the, in the practical video how you can do that. You can also select and customize different scales of the scale bar with the property window. Now to store um, your map there are multiple options here. You can export a PDF uh, which is a contained file format which you 
cannot so easily alter later on, but it has the advantage that it stays like you have originally designed it to be. You can also export a raster image if you want to include that into um, a presentation, for example. A rastered image might be nicer. And you can also export it as SVG or uh, this is a vector based graphic format with which you can keep the uh, vectorized information. But still, if you have a non vector background map, this will be always be rustered in the end also for the PDF. Okay, and now you can go and share your map or print it or do whatever you would like to do with that. Everything is explained in more detail in a practical video. Another way of exporting your uh, features or your different layers is to save them in specific file format, either as uh, shapefiles, for example, uh, like we have loaded them. You always can right-click on the layer, export, and then save features as shapefile, for example, or as a CSV file. If you want to include uh, the coordinates there, you have to select geometry as X and Y. And in that case, then you have additional columns to your um, to your actual data that contains the uh, geo coordinates of the individual files. Also, for that, there is a specific video how you can export information into CSV files to later process them, for example, with other programs. Okay, that's all. Um, and it's yeah, was a bit over thirty minutes, but uh, it's still within range. So if you have watched that uh, and if you watch the practical videos, you should be able to perform all these tasks that uh, I have talked about here. And with that, you have the basic tool set to produce some maps. And um, when you are interested in more spatial analysis, I highly suggest that you will join the GIS course that will be offered in next year. For now, the usual, if you you can access the content of the code uh, of the of the course on the course website, you can always contact me via email if you have any questions or via Slack if you're part of the Slack channel. And uh, with that, I will leave you. We will see each other in the practical part um, and where we try this out together and have a nice week until then.